All right. So just quickly, what are the answers to our two little riddles? This one I sat there and thought about for a few minutes before I looked up the answer and then felt really silly when I saw the answer. So what happens when you throw a white rock into the Red Sea? Well, colors really don't matter. It's just going to sink. That's, your, that's the big riddle. Good morning, right? Um, all right. So what do you get when you take a pumpkin circumference and divide it by the pumpkin's diameter? This is, I mean, this is a funny riddle. But at the same time, it's actually having you use the formula for circumference and remembering what happens when you divide out the d, the diameters. But your circumference is pi d. If you divide that d out, what are you left with? Just some pumpkin pie. So better for the fall, I suppose. But since we will talk about circles a little bit, I thought it was kind of funny. All right, so this is going to be our final review. I would strongly suggest that you take notes with all of the example problems that we are going to go over. So if I had to spell it out any more than that for anybody, well, then I guess you deserve the grade you get, right? Uh, yes, there will be, Karen. There will be a secret phrase. You can get some extra credit for this. All right, so here's just some tips on how to study. Because today is the day, or actually yesterday, is the day that we started technically Unit 7, which is just the final. But there are a few review lessons in Unit 7 that I really like you guys to take, um, take advantage of. So you're going to spend this, this whole week getting ready for your final. In Unit 7, Lesson 3, there's kind of a cool video game in there that I would suggest um, giving a try. It's kind of a good review. There's, um, there's, of course, your reference guide, which remember, all of our tests are open note, open book, right? Who are we to sit there and tell you you can't open them? I mean, I'm not sitting next to you at your kitchen table. So make sure that you utilize all of those resources. Mark your pages. This semester, we covered pages 173 to 306. So put some sticky notes. At the very least, put the sticky notes at the beginning of that section and at the end so that you know where you need to reference. You can also, yeah, how do I know about the kitchen table? Because that is where I currently sit <laughs> while I talk to you guys. My, my teacher desk is, is um, also my kitchen table. You can imagine all the gross food sitting around me right now. <laughs> all right, so our reference guide. Um, also has a cool table of formulas, definitions, and theorems that you can reference very quickly. And it's, it's an appendix at the end, and it's A1 to A18. So if you have your reference guide handy, flip through that back portion, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, it's very handy, very quick reference. You never know when you're going to need some of those formulas or theorems, and that way you don't have to rewrite everything. And then my last and best advice would be to condense all of your notes from the semester, which means rewriting them. But often, that is the best way to learn the material. Um, you'll, you'll hear this in college. You probably heard it in high school as well. But we always recommend that after you've sat through a lecture, you should go home and rewrite your notes. And that way, it will concrete the information you learn. You can get rid of excess, unnecessary uh, information you may have written down. And you condense everything into a nice, neat, organized format. So I would suggest doing that for the whole semester. Spend an hour or two just going through your notes, writing the important parts, getting rid of what's unnecessary. OK, so the topics we've covered. This is everything we've covered for, this, uh, for the final, for the whole semester. And you need to be aware of all of it, right? You have solid shapes. We've got prisms, pyramids, cylinders, cones, and spheres. You need to know the surface area and volume formulas for all of those solids. We've talked about similarities, right? We've talked about. Um, when triangles are similar, you have proportionate sides. We've talked about ratio of areas and volumes. Then we've gotten really into circles. We've covered everything with circles, angles, segments, you name it. We've also come up with the equation of a circle. We've discussed trigonometry, so all our SOCA TOA, right, our sine, cosine, and tangent functions. And then we did cover the non-Euclidean. That's the unit six that we've made optional for you guys. So um, it depends on which class you're in. Most likely, you won't see those questions on the final. If you do, um, just use your best guess. So it's, it's, not, it's quite logical in a lot of ways and um, more applicable to some of the interesting things you see on TV. And Mr. Kirkpatrick did an amazing uh, presentation of some of that stuff last week. So go back and watch last week's recording if you missed any of that. Um, OK, so some of you guys are saying the trig is still bothering you. We can, we'll can we definitely go over examples of the trig today. And then there's also the Unit 5 review that I did a couple weeks ago. You can check out, too. 
here are the facts about our final. So um, for me, I'm going to open the final on Friday. Mr. K is actually really nice to you guys. He's opening it for you today. So I believe, is that right, Mr. K? If he's still, he might, yep, okay. So you guys can start it with Mr. K today. I'm making you wait a couple more days. Um, and then it's going to close on Tuesday. Now this is for all of us. Every math teacher, every teacher, period, cannot extend the final deadline past Tuesday because that's our last day of school. Wednesday is our day to do, um, Wednesday is our day to do grades. We have to submit grades on Wednesday. So we have no time to give you after 5 p.m. So you have to have everything done. There's about 14 questions, 70 points total. And it's, uh, it is not timed, but you can only open it once. Does that help? So when I say it's not timed, though, just be careful. Don't walk away from your computer and allow your computer to time you out. That means, um, that means you can only, you have to save answers. So you don't want to walk away and let your computer malfunction and, and let the test know that you're inactive because you can't reaccess it then. And that's a big nightmare. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten phone calls at 5 p.m. on Tuesday from a student saying, oh my gosh, there's a technical error. So, which there's nothing I can do past that. So you've got to attempt the test earlier if possible. At the very latest, I would say Tuesday morning. That way if something does happen, you can get a hold of one of us. We can try and fix it before the deadline. Um, just so you know that the final is less than 8% of your total grade, which takes some pressure off, right? It's not going to knock you down an entire letter grade necessarily unless you're on the cusp. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't overwhelm you too much. All right, so let's get into some practice problems. You guys remember nets way back, way back in, what was that, January, early February? So a net is where we take a shape and we sort of unfold it, right? And then we can separate those pieces or we can look at each view and call them orthographic views. Yeah, you kind of lay it out, right? So that's a net. Um, and then we also can look at the shape from every angle. We can look at it from the front, the back, the left, the right, the top, the bottom. So let's go ahead and review what, which side would this be? So this is going to, I'm going to tell you right now, this is going to be the front. So imagine standing right here and walking around the shape. So hopefully you guys know your left and your right. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at the front from here. So that would make this the front, right? Okay. So what I would like are some volunteers. All right. That's probably plenty right now. Um, so Dylan, what I want you to do is if you can type or write, I'd like you to tell me which view this is right here that I'm pointing to. So my little finger is pointing to this view. Where would I be standing if it looked like this? Can you type or write that? Very good, Doug. Good, Katie. Oh, you got all of them. Very good. So be careful. This one, so imagine walking around this thing. So let's, let's start simple. Let's start with this one. It's just one clean rectangle, right? Where do you see, which view do you see one clean rectangle without any lines? or any break, what side does that happen to be on? The right side, very good. So if that's the right side, really that's the height of our shape, right? So if you look down here, those are pretty tall. That's, that's not going to be, that's not going to be the side. So these have to be the sides, the left and the right. Well, we know this is the right side because there aren't any lines or breaks. So let's write down right side. Okay, so that means that this piece right here, very good, there we go. Good job, Dylan, that's the left side. Excellent, so oh, good writing skills, because I, I have a bamboo board and that's hard enough. So you're writing with your mouth, that's awesome. All right, good job. So Jessica, you wanna let me know what, let's do um, this one right here, this one's a little trickier. Which view is this? Oh, Dylan, you have a track pad. Oh, that's cool. Okay, good, Jessica, top, perfect. So that's if you were imagining a helicopter looking straight down. You're not going to see the depth of this. 
all you see is just three rectangles, you know, all in a row, basically. So that means that this would be, Alana, you want to write that for me? This one right here, what view would that be? Good, Kevin, you got it. Very good, the bottom. So that just leaves one more. And I think I will have Kevin write that one. Go ahead, Kevin. Which view is this? Now, if any of you guys are confused as to how we're figuring this out, my best advice would be to take some kind of an object, something that has um, that's not just one single rectangle. Like, if you have any Legos around the house, anybody have little brothers or sisters? If you have Legos laying around or, or something like an odd shape, set it on a table and get down to the level of the table and walk around it and see what I'm talking about. You'll see that you don't get depth in that sense. You just see the shape. And so you'll notice that a lot of these, it, it looks kind of odd that the left side is two rectangles, even though they're separated, right? But you don't notice that separation when you're at the level of the object. So that would be my recommendation is to find an object and give it a try. Okay, very good. Let's review volume now. So we're going to find the volume of some solids. We're going to start with the volume of a sphere that has a diameter of 26. So the first thing we need to do is find that formula. So you're either going to look in your notes or look in the book, or if you have an awesome memory, you're going to um, refer to your memory. So can you guys, oh good, I've already got some of you guys typing in the formula. Do you remember it or can you find it really quickly? This is going to help you practice for the actual test. So we've got, close Kevin, wrong fraction, but you've got the power right. Good, Nathaniel, you got it. So the formula, those of you that are looking, keep looking and find it. I'm going to write it down. 4 thirds pi r cubed. Very good. Okay, so we need, what do we need for the formula? What do we plug in? Do we plug in diameter? What does that stand for? The R. Radius. Good. We're going to plug in the radius. Did they give us the radius, though? They did not. So be very careful with things like this. Don't just rush through the problem. Ask yourself specifically, what did they give us? What do we need? They gave us diameter. We need radius. If the diameter is 26, what is the radius? Very good. It's half of that, right? 13. So we know that the diameter goes all the way across, but the radius is half of that. So in this case, we want 13. So now we're just simply going to plug in. And that part's easy. That's when you get your calculator out, plug it all in. So 13 squared, 169. We'll multiply that by 4 thirds. Now what the, the trick, too, is um, looking at your answer choices and deciding, do they want it in terms of pi? Or do they want an estimation, or I'm sorry, an approximation with a decimal? So 13 squared times 4 thirds is 225.3. So um, right, so what we would do is at this point, we have 225.3 pi. If you see that as an answer choice, then that's your answer. If you see a whole bunch of decimals and no pi in your, oh, thank you, Doug. It's 13 cubed. Boy, Miss Fryer made a mistake. Very good catch. Because you know what? I guarantee you the squared answer will be there as one of the choices. And I would have gotten it wrong. Boy, what a big dope I am. OK. 13 cubed is 2,197. Multiply that by 4 thirds. I'm so glad you caught that. OK, so here we go. Here's the answer. So 29, 29.3 pi is our answer. That's going to be um, in terms of pi. If we multiply that out, so you're going to multiply your answer times pi, and you get 92.02. Yes, the test does try to trick you. 0.77. So this would be what we call the approximation because we're using the approximation of pi to find it. So they're not going to have both of these answers. So what I want you to understand is you're not going to have to know which one they're looking for specifically, but just understand that 
when you look to the answers, if there's pi attached, just keep your answer in terms of pi. If, um, if there's no pi attached to any of your answers, then go ahead and multiply it out. So those are the two differences. Um, OK, so Karen, I saw you weren't happy. With, so I'm, let me know what your question is. And I will, I'm scrolling back, and I don't see one. Go ahead and type it in. Are you confused as to how we found the numbers? All right, so remember, first thing you do, find your formula. Look at what they've given you versus what you need. Plug and chug, make sure you do the math right, unlike me. And then look at their answer choices to make sure you're keeping it in the proper form. All right, let's talk about proportional lengths. So proportional lengths, remember, we have all these great ratios and proportions that we can use to set up, um, to set up problems and, and equations to find missing links. So I'm going to fill in what we know. So that's the first thing you do is you draw the diagram on your paper, and then you fill in all the information they gave you. So we need to find the length AT. I'm going to make that an X. We know that CW is 36. So that's the whole length from C up to W. We know that OW is 9. And we know that CT from C all the way to T is 24. All right, so um, now let's set up our ratio. Can we go ahead and compare this entire length to this little length? Will that equal the entire length to the little length? Should that be proportionate? So 36 over 9 equals 24 over x. All right, let's set that up. 36 over 9 equals 24 over x. The key here is making sure you're consistent. So if you put the big number or the long side on top of your left ratio, you need to put the big number or the long side on top of your right ratio. So they gave us 9 right here. OW is 9, so that's where I got the 9. And um, so now we can just cross multiply. You can reduce this first before you cross multiply because it makes your multiplication a lot easier, right? So those are both divisible by 9. So I'm going to reduce that to 4 over 1 equals 24 over x. So now if you cross multiply, you get 4x equals <clears throat> 24. Divide both sides by 4, and what do you get? 6. Ta-da! All right. So um, if you don't cross, or if you don't reduce, that's perfectly OK. You can cross multiply as is and use your calculator or write it out. And move on to the next. Oh, how did I get 4 over 1? I reduced. So I took this fraction and I went ahead and reduced it. Both 36 and 9 are divisible by 9. So I reduced it to 4 over 1. And that equals 24 over x. Yep. All right. OK, let's talk about circles. So notice I'm jumping around concepts, right? I'm not going in the order that we learned the concepts throughout the semester. And the test is going to do the same thing. You have to be ready to jump all over your notes and your book and your memory. So it's not going to go in a nice, neat order that you've learned it in. That's why I'm doing this to you right now. OK, so we want to find, um, we want to find the angle x right here. So Remember that we have four categories of angles. We have central angles. We have um, inscribed angles, which means the vertex is on the circle. We have inside angles and outside angles. So inside means the vertex is somewhere inside the circle, but not on the center. And outside angles means the vertex is outside of the circle. OK. Um, and so. What kind of angle is this? What kind of angle is x of those four categories? Central, inscribed, inside, or outside? What would you guys say? We have four choices. What type? Good. Rashid has got it. Doug, Hannah, Alana, perfect. Alan, you got it. So you guys have the, the right answer. It's an inside angle. So that's when you go to your notes 
and we did a really good session on this where we break it down by type of angle with the formula, right? So everybody should have that in their notes. So for an inside angle, the formula says that it's equal to one half the intercepted arcs added together. So arc one plus arc two, add those together and take half. Good. So when I say intercepted arc, think of this angle as a spotlight, right? It's, it's shining a light on the 70 degree arc. But it also has, it behind it, it's also a spotlight. So it's shining on this arc back here. But we don't have a number, do we? Can we find that number pretty easily, though? So don't freak out if you're saying, oh my gosh, they forgot to put a number. That's OK. How do we find that number? What do we know about a circle? The whole circle adds up to what? Very good, Jacob. You got it. 360. Yes. Good, Brittany. So we know that if we take 360 and subtract these three angles, we will get what's left, right? And that'll be the arc we're looking for. So 360 minus 55 minus 70 and minus 75 all together leaves us with 160. So that means the missing arc right there is 160. Okay, now I can fill in my, um, my formula. So we know that x is equal to 1 half arc 1 plus arc 2. And now add those together, and that should be 230, right? Divide that by 2, and you get 115. Very good. So x is equal to 115 degrees. Not too bad, right? That's pretty easy. OK. So this is just using all the formulas we've ever learned over the semester, just remembering when to use what. All right. What is the value? Sorry, Jacob. I'm faster, yeah. Just some days. Most days, you guys are faster than me. All right, what is the value of S, angle S in the right triangle below? So what are we going to use to find an angle that's missing in a right triangle? Do you guys remember that little um, catchphrase I gave you? Or the, not the catchphrase, I guess, but the, um, the abbreviated. Yes, very good, Jessica. Thank you. I don't know how to say that. My, the Sokotoa. Remember how we wrote down Sokotoa? that time, and that helps us remember which sides go with which, um, oh, whoops, let me write it correctly, not an A, an H. So, ka, toa. That tells us which sides go with which function, right? Okay, I'm looking for S. So remember, ask yourself, which two sides do we have in relationship to S? So we have three options. We have opposite, adjacent, and a hypotenuse. Which ones do we have? Some of you guys are way ahead of me, and you've got it. That's excellent. So from S, I have the opposite, right? Now, where's the hypotenuse? Which two letter, which side makes up the hypotenuse in this triangle here? SR. We don't have a number there, right? We could find it, but we might as well not make more work for ourselves. So we don't have the hypotenuse, but we have the opposite and the adjacent. So we're going to use tangent. Very good, Doug. You got it. So tangent, so the tangent of S, angle S, is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. So that means that the tangent of S, oops, we're going to change the fraction into a nice little decimal. So the tangent of S is equal to, what's 21 over 43? Oh, Rashifa, good. She's got a really cool one. Um, old Harry and his old aunt. Is that the whole thing? No, there must be more to it. <laughs> OK. Let's see. So 21 divided by 43 is 0.488. That is the whole thing. OK, I'll have to look at it again. So 0.4884. All right. So that's the tan of S. How do I isolate S? I want to get S by itself and find the angle. Thanks, Jacob. Do you guys remember? Which, um, not quite, not cotangent, because that's, that is a flip. We call it inverse tangent. Very good. Very good. 
So it's inverse tangent, and it looks like this. If we were to write it out, it's going to be, so that's still an S. That's not a 5. So tan inverse, meaning that little negative 1 is an inverse, 0.4884. All right, so on your calculator, you need to hit the second button or the INV button, depending on the kind of calculator you have. So I would hit second tangent, and then I would type in 0.4884, and we get 26 degrees. So S is equal to 26 degrees. All right, so remember that's using your SOHCAHTOA, your, your um, trig function. And in this case, when the variable is next to sine, cosine, or tangent, you use the inverse function. If your variable is over here in the fraction, then you, um, then you use the regular trig functions, right? You just hit the sine, cosine, or tangent button without that inverse or second button. All right. Circle equations. All right, let's talk about finding the equation of a circle. So we have a standard circle equation. It's also on your notes from unit five. No, unit four, sorry. And that is, let's say x1, oh, whoops, no, x minus x1. Or x minus h, huh? We can do h and k for the center. I don't need that line under there. So we're going to square it equals r squared. So we can use h and k for the center. We can use x1 and y1, whatever you would like to do. So if so far you're able to solve these, you're, you're in great shape. I'm really glad. Um, so what we're going to do is plug, this is the center right here. You tell us the equation, we need to come up with the equation of the circle. It has a diameter of 16 and the center of negative 6, 0. So we're going to be careful with this diameter. Remember, we, we don't want D, we want R. So we're going to have to remember that when we go to plug stuff in. So let's go ahead and plug the center in here. So remember that when we say, when we see x minus h, that means whatever our center is, we're going to change the sign of that number before putting it in here. That's what that means. Very good. So we're going to say x plus 6 squared plus y minus 0 squared. You don't have to write that out. I'll show you what happens in a second. And now I want to put in r right here. So if the diameter is 16, what number should I plug in here? Very good. So a lot of you guys already have it. Remember that radius is half the diameter. They gave us the diameter. Remember, this is a, uh, the whole idea here is they're making sure you're paying attention to the fine details, right? So in this case, the radius is 8. So we want to plug in 8 for r. So now let's go ahead and simplify this. I'm going to leave the x plus 6 in the parentheses. That's fine. We can leave it like that. What happens to the 0 in the other parentheses? It just drops, right? It goes away. Because anything plus or minus 0 is still itself. So y squared, and then this becomes 64. And that's the equation of your circle. It's that simple. Just remembering where to plug everything in and making sure you're using the correct information. So if it helps, write everything down. Print the test out first if you can um, and highlight. Do whatever you need to do to make sure you're not making those small mistakes because that right there is five points. There's no partial credit, right? And that's a bummer. Okay. Special right triangles. Remember, special right triangles um, are, we have two types. We have a 30, 60, 90, and a 45, 45, 90. And there's a special relationship between the sides of the right triangle. So for a 30, 60, 90, right here, that's what we have right here. So we know this is the 60 degree angle. We know that the little leg, if we double it, we get the, um, we get the hypotenuse. If we multiply the little leg by root 3, we get the long leg. So that's the relationship every time. So if I double it, I get 12. That's the hypotenuse. If I multiply by root 3, I get 6 root 3, and that's the long leg. So let's find out exactly what they're asking for. They want the value of sine of A. So first find A. Here it is. I'm going to highlight it so we remember which, which angle we're looking at. I want the sine of A. So the sine of A is equal to which two sides? You can use Sokotoa. You can look at your notes. 
Okay, very good, Jacob. So opposite over hypotenuse, right? So the opposite side to A is 6. Over the hypotenuse is AB, that's 12. So what does that reduce to? What is 6 over 12? 0.5, or 1 half, right? Excellent. So that's our answer. The sine of A is just a half. So we don't have to find anything else. They didn't ask us for the angle A. They asked us to find sine of A. So that means we can stop. We don't have to separate the sine and the A to find A, right? So there you go. That's using special right triangles and trig functions all in one question. Okay. Ratios and area, a ratio of areas and volumes. So this is a really easy concept as long as you have it written down correctly in your notes. So remember, we're going to write it down again just in case. We have scale factor. That's where we always start. The scale factor is where we just compare two similar sides. So a scale factor would be A to B. Whatever numbers you have is A to B. That should be a dot, it's not an exclamation. There we go. So that's our scale factor. You take that scale factor and you can find the ratio of areas and the ratio of volumes very simply. You just square your A and your B for areas. And then ratio of volume, you cube it. It really is just that simple as, oh, that's a cube. A cubed to B cubed. Oy, my board is not cooperating. OK, let's try that again. A cubed to B cubed. All right. Let's look at what they gave us then. So in this case, they're telling us that CA is equal to 12 and AT is equal to 3. So let's label our diagram and make sure we're using the right information. 12 and then AT is 3. Now, we want to compare two similar triangles. So let's look at this, the triangles. So one triangle would be COA. Does that make sense? So I'm going to highlight that. Triangle COA is one triangle. What's the other triangle that I'm comparing it to? Can everybody identify that? So give me the three letters of the other triangle. Very good. So Karen, Chris, Kayla, you got it. CWT. So let's highlight that one in blue. CWT. So I need to compare two similar sides. Does it work to just compare 12 and 3 then? So that would be the little side here, CA. Am I comparing, if I use the number 3, am I actually comparing two similar sides? So again, they're, they're not tricking you on purpose. They're making sure you're paying attention to the fine details. So I want to compare the side CA with the side CT, right? That would be comparing two similar sides. So what two numbers am I going to use? 12 and what? Very good. You got it, Kayla, Jessica. OK, so be careful. Some of you have to add them together, right? So you're comparing 12 to 15. Does everybody understand why? I'm comparing side CA to side CT. Those are the similar sides in the triangle. They didn't give me the length of CT, but they gave me enough information to find it. So you just add them together, and you get 15. All right, so now I have a scale factor. Can I reduce the scale factor? Yes, you can. You can reduce the scale factor. So we're going to divide both of these by 3 to get 4 to 5. So that's a reduced scale factor. That's my A to B. So I'm going to write that up here. So now that it's reduced, I, now I can go ahead and take that scale factor and get my ratio of areas. So what's the ratio of areas going to be? Very good. Excellent, you guys. You all know how to square numbers. That's awesome. 16 to 25. My dots keep connecting. This is driving me nuts. OK. And then what about ratio of volumes? What's that going to be? You might need to get your calculator out for that one, huh? What's 4 cubed? Very good, Brittany. You got it. You're fast. 
lightning fast. All right, 64 to 125. That'll be our ratio of volumes. So as long as you're comparing correct sides for your scale factor, the rest is easy. So just make sure you're either highlighting the triangles that you should be comparing, or you can even separate them. You can draw them separately and fill the numbers in that way if that helps. So whatever works for you, just don't make the mistake that you're going to compare 12 and 3, because that would have given you the wrong ratio. All right, a couple more solids. We'll, we'll do some more solid examples. So the diameter of the base of a right cone is 6. So let's draw that in. So they're giving us the diameter. Notice they love to give you guys diameters when we rarely use diameters, right? If the surface area is 39 pi, the so surface area equals 39 pi, we need to find the slant height. Remember that's that little L that hangs out out here? So the first thing I want you guys to do is find the formula for surface area of a cone. So everybody use your notes, your book, whatever you have. What's the surface area of a cone? So while everybody's looking, um, Alexis, no, the, the extra credit hasn't been given yet. So I'm counting on you guys to know where to find your formulas. If you don't, you're going to be really upset when you're trying to take your test, huh? Very good, Ryan. Okay, so we're going to find the area of the base, right? Plus pi RL. So is everybody... All right, so hang on. Let me... Let me verify that one second. Okay, so here's what I had in, in the notes I gave you. So it's capital B plus one half PL, which a lot of you guys are giving me. Um, <laughs> so um, with, in a reduced form, which is excellent. So I'm going to use the one that I was um, teaching before. And we'll get it down to the reduced form you guys are giving me. Okay, so surface area, SA is equal to B plus one half PL. And so I'm going to make, I'm going to replace SA with 39 pi, because I know that the surface area is 39 pi. And I'm going to plug in everything else that I can, right? So, um, so that's pi. That little symbol right there is pi. So they gave us the diameter of six. What does that mean for the radius then? If the diameter is 6, we need to replace that with the information we will use, which is a 3, right? So radius of 3. So the area of the base is pi r squared, so pi 3 squared, plus 1 half, capital P means perimeter of the base, right? So that's 2 pi r times the slant height. So there's our formula. That's all equal to 39 pi. Okay, let's simplify what we can. So 3 squared is 9, so that's 9 pi. The 1 half and the 2 are going to cancel right there. So we end up with 3 pi L. And L is what we're looking for. That's the slant height, right? That's our variable, is the L. So this is all equal to 39 pi. So let's try and get L by itself. Now, I can't combine the 9 pi and the 3 pi L, can I? Because one has an L on it and the other doesn't. So that's one with a variable, one without. So you're not allowed to do that. So what I'm going to do first is subtract 9 pi over here. So if I minus 9 pi from 39 pi, I get 30 pi. So 30 pi is equal to 3 pi L. So what am I going to do now to get L by itself? What would you guys say? Good, Brittany, you got it. We're going to divide. We're going to divide both sides by 3 pi. That means the pi's are going to cancel, and 30 divided by 3 is 10. So that means the slant height, or L, is equal to 10. And that's our answer. So not too bad, right? Remember, find your formula. 
Okay, so let me go over the, what each one stands for. B is area of the base. Capital B, area of the base. Capital P is the perimeter of the base, or the circumference, right? Perimeter of the base. So whenever you see a capital, it's talking about the base of your shape. So if your base is a rectangle, if your base is a circle, a triangle, you have to focus on that base and find the area of that whole base or the perimeter of that whole base. So does that help? Now, if you have them written out in another way, absolutely use them whatever way works for you. Okay, I'm not telling you this is the only way. This, is, this helps me memorize the formula simply because it works for any one base shape. Whether it's a cone or um, a pyramid, this formula works for both of them. And, and then you can sort of uh, customize them depending on the base. So that's how I work it. But it doesn't mean you have to do the same thing. OK, let's try another circle problem. We want, um, so yes, Doug, that was surface area for a cone. But it also works for surface area of a pyramid that same formula that I used. All right, so we have, um, we have segments in a circle. So this one's a little different than the angle in a circle, right? So we're looking for the segment LM. We need this portion right here. So let's go ahead and call it X. We'll fill it in with an X. Now let's ask ourselves, what kind of segments do we have? We have a tangent, right? This is a tangent right here. And this is a secant. So we have formulas that help us with a secant and a tangent. Remember what it is? This is where you refer back to your notes or the book. It's the outside times the entire secant. And that equals tangent squared. Yeah, or whole. You can write. I know entire is kind of a silly long word, huh? So the outside times the whole equals the tangent squared. So we're going to just plug that in. How long is the outside of the tangent? I'm sorry, the outside of the secant. Good. All right, so you guys have it. So just the outside portion of the secant is what we call x, right? What's the entire length of the secant from L all the way to N? Now be careful when you write this. If you have to, think of it in terms of numbers first so you remember which operation to use. If I told you this was a 3, what would the whole length be from L to N? It would be 9, right? And you added those together. So don't forget to add your X and your 6 together. But a common mistake is when students write 6X, when they multiply them. And that doesn't help, right? So that's going to equal the tangent squared. 4 squared. So let's go ahead and distribute. So we get x squared plus 6x equals 16. So let's go ahead and subtract that 16 over to the left side so we can get everything on one side of the equation. Notice we have a trinomial, so we're going to factor. So x squared breaks down into x and x. This is old algebra, right? Now, what two numbers multiply to 16 but subtract to 6? 8 and 2. Very good. So it's not a very difficult factoring. So 8 and 2. Now, I want a positive 6. So, I, and since I'm subtracting, they each have to have a different sign. If I want a positive 6, that means the bigger number needs to be positive. Now, when I separate them and, and set them each equal to 0 and solve, you get x plus 8 equals 0, and x minus 2 equals 0. So I'm going to subtract the 8. I get x equals negative 8. I'm going to add the 2, get x equals 2. Are both of these answers OK? What do you guys think? Good, Nathaniel. Yes, they are not both OK. Can I have a negative 8 as a length? I mean, this is real stuff here. We're, we're building with wood and everything else, right? So you're not allowed to have a negative number for a length. So what that means is it's, we call it an extraneous solution, right? It's not allowed. So our only answer is x equals 2.
So, yep, only two can be the length. Perfect. All right, let's talk about transformations. Remember these? <laughs> so we have dilations, which you've studied not too long ago. So if the triangle is dilated by a factor of 3.5, what is the image of that point A? So if we have a triangle ABC, and you'll see a diagram most likely. So ABC. So the point A is at coordinate 5, negative 2. Um, so we want to know what happens when we dilate that triangle by a factor of 3.5. Now your original image, do you guys remember the, the vocab word for the original image? What's it called? Very good, the pre-image, exactly. So your original image is the pre-image. Those are the original coordinates that they give you. Then when we dilate it, we get the image, which is the new shape, right? So dilations are very simple. You just take this factor and you multiply it by your coordinate, and that'll give you the new, the new values. So we're going to take 3.5 and we're going to multiply it. It's called a scalar. Multiply it by 5 and negative 2. So 5 times 3.5 is 17.5. And then 3.5 times negative 2 is negative 7, 7.0, right? So that would be our image, our new image of A. And we, we write it like this, A prime. We give it a little tick mark. OK, so here's some facts about dilation that you need to remember. A positive number right here means that the image is going to overlap the pre-image, right? It's there, one's going to overlap it. Either it'll be a contraction or an expansion. So if it's a contraction, it'll exist inside. If it's an expansion, it's outside. If it's a negative number, if your dilation factor is a negative number, it'll project in the opposite direction. So your new image will actually be in the opposite direction. If your factor is greater than 1, whether it's negative or positive, look at the absolute value of it. If it's basically, if it's not a fraction, if it's a number bigger than one, um, then you have uh, a dilation, a, a, an expansion, right? So we should write the word expansion instead of dilation. And then if, if your number is between zero and one, meaning it's a, a small number, a fraction, then it's going to be a contraction, all right? So those are some interesting facts about dilation that you definitely want in your notes somewhere. All right. So let's do the last one here. I'm going to go ahead and flip to the next page. Oh, actually, that was the last one. So here's a couple more helpful hints. We're pretty much done here. You want to know, this is key here. I didn't practice these because they're just straight up algebra and a, and a practice of your um, computation skills. So. Um, And so what you what you want to do is practice the distance formula for two and three dimension. Remember, we gave you formulas for both. So you want to make sure that you can use the distance formula for an xy coordinate, or between two xy coordinates, and between xyz coordinates, all right? Know how to use the midpoint formula. And then have all your vocab and definitions organized and easy to find, right? So that's that whole idea of rewriting your notes. Those are the three most important things. All right. So at this point, I'm just going to open it up to any questions. And I'm going to go ahead and give you guys the secret phrase. The secret phrase is right down here at the bottom. Enjoy your summer. Because I want to read a million enjoy your summer comments. That's just going to be my, my favorite thing to grade, because I'm going to enjoy my summer. And so, yes, this recording will be posted for you guys. So you can go back and watch any of it again, take more notes if you need to. Um, OK, so I think we're, we have 14 questions on the final, it looks like. So I may have given you guys some wrong. Uh, yes, you sure can. You can use notes on your final. 
we encourage you to keep your notes nice and organized and your book in front of you. Have all your resources right there so that you don't get anything wrong because you didn't memorize the formula. You just need to know how to use them, right? So that's the most important thing. So your extra credit secret phrase, I'm, I'm pointing to it right here. Okay, so Alexis, um, if the dilation factor is positive and greater, hold on, let me go back up, greater than one, does that mean that the image expands and overlaps? Yes, very good. Good, good uh, assessment of that. All right. Um, Let's see, can we take the test before the 14th? If you're in Mr. Kirkpatrick's class, yes, the answer is yes. You have access to the final today. I'm making you guys study a little more. Uh, yeah, go ahead and scroll through the screens, you guys. You have access to all the screens now. My test will open up on Friday. If you really need to take it before then, just let me know. I can open it earlier. I was just trying to give you guys some time to, to watch our session today. and. Um, no. Okay, so that's a really good question. When the timer runs out, do you kick, get kicked out of the final? The answer is no, but here's the trick to this. If you were just working through problems and not really active on the computer, it would, um, it would actually time you out in that sense. It would show inactivity and it would shut the final down on you. So it's really important that you hit save answers as often as possible. Some of you that are using Firefox or, or um, Explorer should be getting prompts to do that. So you cannot walk away and start studying again and decide to take it a little later. Once you open it, that's it. It's a done deal. So don't mess that up, all right? All right, so any other questions about the final? Oh, some of you guys said you wanted the PowerPoint, so let me send that your way. Give me two seconds. You can save this to your desktop if you want. There's no part two test for the final. Um, so you don't have to worry about a part two this time. Lucky you. All right, there it goes. So feel free to save that. That's the PowerPoint we just went over today. Okay, Yvette, go ahead. What's your question? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. I think, yeah, I think we answered all the questions.